Uh, this is a reminder to turn down your uh, your cell phones or your vibrators or whatever. <laughs> this is actually a joke on me. You know, I use this slide all the time. Uh, those of you who know what you want, realize this slide is very old. Right? Oh, you all realize that? I, I speak to groups that grow, and they don't know how yeah. old this slide is, right? Um, so this is how this is how much things have changed in only in only ten years. It's astonishing. Now, uh, I want to talk about narratives about youth sexuality. What is it that the big world is saying about youth sexuality? They're very concerned that young people are going to harm themselves and that they're going to exploit others. And they're very concerned that they don't know what love is. And you know, in the in the big world. You're supposed to pair love and sex, and if you don't know what love is, that makes you kind of ineligible to have real sex, according to the popular narrative. Um, a lot of adults are concerned that young people are going to have sex the wrong way. They don't say exactly what that means, but, but they're concerned that, that they're going to do it in the wrong way. And uh, finally, um, the adult world is concerned that young people are having sex when they're drunk or stoned. And of all of these concerns, I think perhaps that's the one really legitimate, that young people are having sex when they're drunk or stoned, or they're deciding whether or not to have sex when they're drunk or stoned. I think of young people as a sexually repressed minority. When you think about the ways in which this demographic, this section of the United States, um, when you think about how these are people from whom information is systematically withheld, Healthcare services and products systematically with help. That there are laws regulating the sexual choices of this group. That this group is not allowed to own their bodies or pictures of their bodies. And that these people typically do not have much of a public policy voice. Um, we, we in American society would not tolerate if this stuff applied to an ethnic group, to, um, to uh, a gender group, to any other group in society where all this stuff is systematically done to, to, to a group of people the way it's done to youth. Now, um, in many ways, in many ways, um, youth sexuality is very similar to adult sexuality, and not in a good way. Performance anxiety, you know? Young people are concerned, am I gonna get it up? Am I gonna keep it up? Am I gonna get wet? Am I gonna get wet in the right places? Am I going to call out the wrong name while I'm having an orgasm? <laughs> uh, just like growth. Ambivalence about contraception. Very common among young people, unfortunately. Very common among adults. Alcohol and drug use. Young people are not the only people who are medicating their anxiety about sexuality with drugs and alcohol. Adults do it too. Massive levels of misinformation. I wish I could say that there's some magic day on which young people become wise older people about sex. I still get email from people who are 30 years old who are wondering, can you get, can you get pregnant for anal sex? I still get patients walking into the office, college educated people, who really don't know how the menstrual cycle works, or who really don't know that it doesn't matter what men want in bed, what matters is what George wants in bed. And if you want to know what George wants in bed, instead of referring to a group of 3 billion people, you should ask the world's expert on George, and I'm not that person. Um, adults still have, uh, a lot of adults have confusion about how their bodies work, how each other's bodies work, and when adults have sex, pleasure and intimacy is not guaranteed, and that's true for young people as well. In my new book, Sexual Intelligence, I talk about the three components of sexual intelligence, which I would like for us to be promoting among young people as well as adults, and that's information, emotional skills, and body awareness. By the way, if you want a copy of the slides at the end of the show, at the end of my show, not their show, at the end of my show, my email address will be on the screen. So don't leave before then. <laughs> Young people need information. Information about how bodies work, information about uh, how to actually talk to each other. They need emotional skills, how to handle their anxiety, how to be able to say know and feel good about themselves, how to be able to say to somebody, um, if you want to do A, we got to talk about B. And of course, uh, young people as well as adults need more of a sense of body awareness. It's not enough to just get loaded and not care about what's going on with your body. And it's not enough to look in the mirror and say, well, my lipstick is on right, or I've got uh, you know, the right purple dye in my hair, so I guess it's all going to be okay. 
Young people need to know way more about their bodies. The fact that people still wonder, can you get pregnant from anal sex, is in, in, in the day of mobile phones and rockets to the moon, it's just astonishing. So speaking of sexual intelligence, that leads us to talking about sexual literacy. Young people need sexual literacy, and they need to be supported in acquiring sexual literacy. And that means creating sex that fits with your values. Of course, that would suggest that people need to know what their values are. And of course, we're not uh, spending enough time talking to young people about their values. Some of us talk about values such as honesty, consent, and responsibility. Those sound great, and they can be very complicated in real life. And so people would need to, to talk a little bit about that. And sexual literacy also underpins creating sex that nourishes yourself and nourishes other people. It's not enough to get the stuff between your legs to jump through hoops. That's not a guarantee that you're going to have an enjoyable time, and it's not a guarantee that you're going to feel good emotionally. So we want to really educate the entire public, whether it's young people or adults, we want to educate the public that what sexuality is all about is not about some function, some, uh, some mission that certain parts of your body go on, but rather it's about creating an experience. And for some people, that experience is going to include an erection. For some people, it's going to include vaginal lubrication. For other people, at a particular time, it won't. And that's not the single most important determinant about is this an enjoyable, nourishing experience for somebody. So when we talk about uh, sexual intelligence and sexual literacy, um, we're not talking about limiting danger or preventing harm. That's not what sexuality education should be about. It's not what our mission should be about, and it's not what young people really care about. You don't hear a lot of 15-year-olds walking around being afraid they're going to die soon. You don't hear a lot of 15-year-olds walking around saying, I'd love to have sex, but you know, there's all these unwanted consequences. I'm so concerned. You don't hear a lot about this. Now, that, was, that was the amazing thing about the ridiculous uh, controversy about Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, a few years ago. Bridget Moore of the Family Research Council, uh, Abstinence uh, Clearinghouse, I mean, she actually said, we don't want to give 12 year old girls Gardasil because they might feel, well, now they're safer, they can go and have sex. You know, as if you see a lot of 12 year olds standing around saying, gee, Kevin, I'd love to, but you know, I might get HPV, I might get cervical cancer, I might die 51 years from now. That's a complete misunderstanding of how young people operate. So we're not wanting to talk so much about limiting danger or preventing harm, but rather we want to help people, in this case, people who happen to be young, we want to help people develop their emotional skills and their sexual vision and their desire to connect. This doesn't happen in one day. It doesn't even happen over the course of two conversations. This is a lifelong project for human beings. And for young people, it's the beginning of a career. It's launching a sexual career. And that's how we want people to think about it, launching a sexual career. And what is that career aimed toward? So we want to support healthy sexual expression rather than attempting to prevent sexual expression. Now, of course, there are people out in the culture who their, uh, their primary response to anxiety about sexuality is say, well, let's just shut the whole enterprise down. And of course, that hasn't worked. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. And even if it did work, it would be a terrible idea. So when it comes to crafting programs, when it comes to public policy in the big world, we want to see young people as partners rather than as problems. And I had a wonderful, wonderful mentor. He's still around on the Upper East Side in New York. And what he uh, has said in his pregnancy prevention program is young people aren't at risk, they're at opportunity. And I love that. I love that. Now, the internet and mobile devices have created um, a world for young people that adults pretty much are excluded from. And that this is now the climax of sort of a 50-year development in American culture. I remember, this is how old I am, folks. When I was 16 for my birthday, I got an extension telephone for my birthday. <laughs> it was the family telephone. And I was so grown up, I was allowed to have an extension. <laughs> but for the first time, 
you could, at 10 o'clock at night, talk to one of your pals without the grown-ups being around. This was a very big deal. It shook up a lot of households. <laughs> and things have only evolved from there. And it's also pretty nervous about this space because, you know, they're, they really, and not only are they excluded geographically, like you could close the door to your bedroom, but now it's also excluded because they can't figure out how to make these gadgets work. <laughs> they're really excluded. Kind of like, you know, imagine having a refrigerator full of goodies in your house, but there's a lock on the door, and you can't, you don't have a key to the lock, and you, and you really want to get into the refrigerator, you're hungry. That's how a lot of adults are with young people right now. So why are adults so revved up about youthful sexuality? Why are adults so concerned? Now, of course, there is a certain amount of love and concern. I'm sure there are three or four parents somewhere. Um, <laughs> probably on the East Coast. Um, <laughs> I know you're concerned about your kids. Well, you're for, I don't know that yet, but um, so, so why are adults so concerned? Well, you know, partly when you see young people all full of energy and life and the sexuality sort of spilling out of them, it's a terrible reminder to adults that they're not young anymore. <laughs> Never underestimate the depth of despair that adults can feel. <laughs> about not being young. Look around the room if you see anybody who's older than you or they're nodding their head. <laughs> it's a reminder that adults are not young anymore. It's a reminder that adults are not in control. You know, when, when adults park kids at school, at least they feel the school is in control. Uh -huh. but, when, but when young people go off and have sex or think about sex, adults feel that's one thing that I'm not in control. It's a reminder if an adult has had a particularly traumatic experience or a set of experiences around sexuality, it's a constant reminder of that. And it's, um, it re-stimulates, young people's sexuality re-stimulates adults' guilt and shame about their own impulses. Whether they're impulses toward other adults, whether they're sexual impulses toward young people, sexual impulses toward people that they're not supposedly be having sexual thoughts about. And adult concern about youthful sexuality now is also a, a, a panic response to new technology. Contemporary, contemporary society always has a panic response to new technology, whether it was the car, whether it was pottery 5,000 years ago, whether it's uh, the invention of movable type. There was a big concern in England when the price of books dropped in the 19th century, and the slogan was, would you want your maid to read that? So whenever there's a new technology, there's a panic about the new technology. And we're seeing that in spades now, of course, around young people's sexuality. And finally, there's political manipulation. Adults, and parents in particular, are being manipulated politically. They're being encouraged to fight sexuality and teen autonomy as a way of dealing with their own feelings of powerlessness and alienation. So, what we have today is, here's my equation that describes today, when you have a situation of sexuality and youth and technology, what you get is panic. The United States is caught in the grip of a moral panic about not just each of these three things, the combination of <coughs> And the country is still wrestling with what are we going to do about what feels to some people like a very volatile mix. And our job, I think, is first of all to talk about the fact that there's a pan and to label it a pan. It's a public, it's, it's a public policy uh, disaster when people are responding to emotion rather than the actual needs of people in the country. People need information. The panic says we need less information. People need support in making choices. The panic says people shouldn't be making choices. Let's make the choice for you. People need more literacy to use the new uh, technological tools that they have. And what the panic says is we need to take these things out of people's hands and we need to pass tons and tons and tons of laws to punish people when they make mistakes about the way that they use these tools. So I think of us as the anti-panic brigade, right? And if you want to know more about um, uh, moral panics and sexual panics, uh, 
how that affects people and public policy. I'm happy for you to read my book, America's War on Sex. Thank you very much for being here.